This week I'm revisiting a shape you may have seen me throw, trim and assemble before, although in this video we're catching up with the rest of that process, which includes working with a new glaze I hope you folks are going to like, resulting in what might be the best pouring pot I've ever made, but you'll have to wait to the end to see that. I should also mention at this stage that I've been working on another project that's still under embargo, which means I can't show you those particular pots. This teapot was fired alongside many of those pieces, so a few of the kiln packing and firing clips in this film have been added purely to add context. I'll also be making a much longer video about those embargoed pots after the project has been officially announced, sometime in the winter most likely. Anyhow, with all that said, let's get back to the pot at hand. I like to throw the bodies of my teapots on backs. This way the pots can be lifted off the wheel without any distortion in the delicate rim. This is the shape I want to recreate, but on a smaller scale. It has an angled top and a stepped lid, and I think the new mossy green glaze I've been using will look wonderful on it. I dampen the bat in order for the ball of clay to stick. It shouldn't be soaking, otherwise the lump of clay will just hydroplane off. But if the MDF bat is completely dry, this high iron stoneware will stick to it for a moment and then very quickly peel off. With the lump of clay centered, it's opened up and for this piece I'm leaving a relatively thick base as the new glaze I plan on using can go on in a thinner layer. So I aim on trimming a deep footwell, which I can later glaze. The thicker ring of clay around the outside is then pinched and pulled up. Not all in one go, but in a number of pulls, and I'm purposefully leaving the upper portion of the wall relatively thick as I need enough material to collar in and throw the rim with. The lidded forms I make don't have the typical dropped in gallery you might expect on most teapots. Instead I throw a small raised gallery and it's into this opening the lid will slot. With the rough form made, I'll begin tidying up the shape prior to removing it from the wheel. This begins with scraping away the slip that covers the piece. It's also when I throw the more exacting angles in the shoulder of the pot, and as the rim was wavering rather a lot, I sliced the undulation away using the sharp edge of a turning tool. I then chamois leather the lip smooth, just to neaten up the surface, and then I measure the width of the opening using a pair of calipers. I then hold a twisted metal wire taut and slide it underneath the pot, separating it from the bat. It's pretty similar to the original, I think, although ultimately it will be the lid, handle and spout which do the most work in making them look the same. The bat itself can then be pried off the teapot set aside. Next I need to flip my calipers so they measure the same diameter but from the outside. So I press the points into stoneware to make two indentations and then I take a measurement of these dots but from the outside, giving myself an extra millimetre or two though to work with as I prefer having slightly too much material in the lid which I can turn away in order for it to fit perfectly rather than throwing it the same size and then risking something changing or warping resulting in the lid simply not fitting. And normally when you find this out is when the components are leather hard and at that stage it can be very difficult to add extra material to the lid in order to turn it to fit. Although there is one sneaky thing you can do, but I'll show you that later on in the video. First though, I have to throw the lid and the spout and begin the trimming process. The lid itself is a much easier shape to throw as there's practically no height to it. And in the past, I used to throw my lids to really exacting standards, making sure every plane was lovely and straight and the lips smooth and chamois leathered. But at the end of the day, these are objects I'm going to trim so much. These lids do practically have every single surface trimmed. So in actuality, it doesn't matter if they are left a bit rough, as I'd rather throw boring pieces like this quickly as compared to spending twice as long fussing over them. The most important thing is that this measurement is correct. And with all the slip removed, the lid is wide off, now to be set aside along the teapot's body. And at this stage, all that's left to be thrown is the spout. Now, I am using a much larger piece of clay for this, but I'm not just throwing one large spout. When I make spouts, I like to throw them off the hump. This is what we call the process of throwing a smaller pot atop a much larger mass of clay. And for things like spouts that can be a bit finicky and tricky to make, I prefer throwing them off the hump. I'm also going to be making about two or three spouts, as they're still probably the thing I'm most unsure about when creating teapots. So I'd rather give myself some options to play with as I also don't make many teapots this size. So making these is still a learning experience for me. I initially throw my spouts with relatively thick walls and then I scrape over them from the outside, thinning them and creating the profile I want. I then do a second pass to smooth them, after which I trim away a groove around the base. This way I define an area I'll be able to drag the wire through. It acts like a guide almost. 
Then, with dry fingers, I very carefully pluck the spout away. I'm not squeezing it at all with my fingertips. Instead, I just make contact, and as the clay is sticky, the spout clings to my fingertips as I lift it off, like so. When I was making and filming this, it was rather warm in the studio, so how I dry them overnight is important. I want the spouts to remain really soft, so I'm going to place a container over them, creating a small airtight environment. As for the other parts, I'm just going to sling some plastic loosely over them, making sure the plastic doesn't cling and stick to them, and it's left with some openings overnight, so air can get inside and circulate around the drying pieces. It's the following day, and the body and lid are now perfectly leather hard and ready to trim. The lid is a touch too big for the opening, as intended, as I'll be able to trim it to fit really well. And so, that's where I'll start, with the lid positioned upside down and secured in place with three lumps of soft clay to prevent it from spinning out of place. The first thing I do is trim away all the unevenness left from when I threw it, roughly. Next, I'll trim away a slither from the side of the locating flange. Then, in order to test if it fits, I simply lower the body of the teapot over it. It's slotted over well, so from this point I'll continue tidying up the rest of the shape. There's still quite a lot of work to do on the lid, but it will be more easily done when positioned in the opening of the teapot the right way up, as the opening of the teapot will hold the lid in place like a chuck. The body of the teapot itself is attached to the wheel via a thin skim of slip, which is a topic I made a much longer video about recently, a link to which I'll leave on screen now and in the description below. And with the body firmly held in place, I'll begin refining the shape of the teapot body. I thin the walls with a tungsten carbide trimmer, and then scrape over them with a metal scraper, as this removes some of the chattering marks tungsten carbide tools often leave. By attaching the pot to the wheel like this, I can trim the entirety of the walls from top to bottom without any bits of clay getting in the way, and as I can reach my fingers inside this shape, I can feel the thickness of the wall as I trim, which means I know exactly how much I can get away removing. To trim the top side of the lid, I simply slot it into the opening, and as it fits snugly, I can trim it in situ like this. But I'm also going to pin it down with a spinner on top, just in case the lid does try and leap out during the trimming process. The lid is wavering rather a lot, but I should be able to fix that with some careful trimming. Although I think due to this, I'll end up with a lid that's slightly thinner than I imagined, which is a bit disappointing. I find this really small tungsten carbide blade works wonderfully for removing material from the sides. And at this stage, I'm just going to trim a very rough step into the side of the lid, as it will be easier to properly define it later on. What I should have done is leave the undulation in the lid, as despite it wobbling around rather a lot, as soon as the wheel stops, you simply don't notice it. And I think in my correcting it, which is what I'm doing now, by only turning away the highest point that spins around, I did make it a touch too flat for the overall shape, but not enough for me to despise it, so I'll keep going. The next step is to pierce a hole in the lid. This will eventually help draw air through the vessel as it's poured, helping to prevent the liquid from glugging and sputtering as you use it. And if your lid fits really well, if you cover the hole, it can stop the tea from pouring out altogether, which I'll demonstrate towards the end of this video rather well, I think. For now though, a small hole is pierced in the very centre, and then it's flipped over and I tidy up the exit wound, removing the burrs of clay that surround the hole. You can also see here how the underside of the step isn't very well defined, but again I'll be fixing that later. The last step here is to trim the rim to be much thinner, as previously its bulk didn't really match the refined finish this part has. Now, I think I was a bit overzealous with some of my trimming, as there was a tiny bit of wiggle room with the lid, meaning it rattled ever so slightly when slotted into the opening of the teapot. And so here's that sneaky method I told you about earlier that you can do to fix this, and that's to simply, very gently, bend the rim inward. I'm probably moving it by about half a millimetre or so, but even that is enough to make all the difference. Just please be careful if you try this, and don't push too hard, as it's really easy to simply destroy the rim of the vessel, for it to suddenly bow in too much, or for it to simply crack. The next thing I'll do is slice the teapot off the wheel by sliding a sharp metal skin beneath it. I can then use the lid, like a chuck, for the body, slotting the two together, securing the lid in place with some bits of clay, and then I can begin carving away the footwell I want this teapot to have. 
and as I'm shaving back the layers, I'm constantly pressing down gently with my thumb, checking to see how thin the base is. If I press on the bottom and it begins to bow inward, even just a tiny amount, I won't trim away anymore. The outer beveled portion of the foot is then stamped with my maker's mark, but we're still not quite finished, as the very last thing I'll do is finish defining that step on the underside of the lid, together with cleaning over any scuff marks caused by the rim of the teapot's body rubbing against the lid. And as I need to trim so close to the wheel head, instead of securing the lid in place with lumps of clay, I'll use a spinner on top to push down through, pinning the lid against the metal. And I use my tiniest steel turning tool to create this right angle, which I hope the glaze will break interestingly over. And the last thing I do for the lid is burnish over the really sharp edges, simply by pushing my fingertips against them, just to make sure they aren't razor sharp, as those would be quite likely to chip. We're getting there. The next step is to attach the spout, and thereafter the handle is pulled. For this step, instead of moving over to the workbench, I tend to just slot a wearboard over the wheel. The spouts have been uncovered for about two hours or so, this way they aren't too soft, and they hold their shape as I slice at a 45 degree angle much of the excess away from the bottom. And again, I'm following the same practice I've been doing all along. I don't remove the perfect amount straight away. Instead, I cut away the excess bit by bit, slowly getting it to fit, instead of, say, cutting away tons of material straight away and risking that I actually make it too small for the shape of the teapot. I use a needle to curve the bottom, and then I cut away much of the excess from the inside, thinning the walls further, but leaving enough clay so there's material to blend into the body of the teapot when it comes to attaching it. This isn't the most elegant solution, and the innards do look a bit rough at the moment, but bear with me. Once enough of the excess material has been sliced away, including this final slither from the bottom, I'll take a sponge on a stick, soak it in water, and then fettle away the surfaces on the inside. This will smooth over all those marks left by the knife, although it will also leave a rather gritty surface as the clay is worn away and the larger particles of grog are brought to the surface. And although sadly not captured, I then burnish the interior surface of the spout with both my little finger and the smooth circular side of a hole piercer. The spout is then offered up to the teapot, and as it is still relatively soft, I can tack it in place like so, which means I can use a needle to score around it so I know exactly where to pierce the holes. I should mention, that when attaching the spout, I make sure the tip of it is in line with the gallery of the teapot. If it's placed too low or at the incorrect angle, not only will the vessel pour worse, but if placed really incorrectly, you can only fill the vessel up halfway before it begins to all pour out the spout. I then take the spout off and pierce a series of holes. These will strain the tea leaves or tea bags, preventing them from clogging the spout as you pour. I then scrape away the burrs of clay on the front and then use a tapered dowel to push into each of them to round them off, make them more uniform and to ensure the clay on the inside of the holes is smooth. This way the glaze will hopefully coat them more evenly. I then score some lines all the way around the holes, place the spout into a shallow bowl of water for a few moments to soften up the base portion and make it easier to blend into the teapot body. I coat the scored section in slip, dabbing it over, not brushing it, and then I take the spout blow off any excess water that coats it, and firmly press it against this scored section, making sure to really line it up with the holes on the inside, which is why I take the lid off here. The spout's clay being soft means I can angle it even at this point, moving it into the perfect position where it projects at about a 45 degree angle from the teapot's body. And once I'm happy with its positioning, I can begin to blend the soft clay into the body of the teapot, making the join as seamless and flush as I can. For those tricky to reach areas, as I don't want to obliterate the line above, I'll again use one of these hole piercers to blend the clay in. With the rough blending done, I then fettle over the join with a soaked sponge on a stick to remove the areas where the clay looks obviously smeared.
on the bottom, it's all about making sure the curve is right, as I want the spout to look like it flows into the body really naturally. And this, again, is another place where this sponge like this works wonderfully, as it can be used like sandpaper almost, to grind away the clay to make the curve seamless. You just have to be careful the walls of the spout are thick enough, as if you've made them too thin and then try fettling them this much, you can actually begin to deform the spout as the saturated soft clay begins to bow inward. As for the lip of the spout, I try not to touch it too much, as I want to preserve the thrown edge I gave to it, but I find it works best if the edge is very sharp. This way it really cuts the liquid when you stop pouring with it, which prevents it from dribbling too much. If, on the other hand, it has a very rounded edge, when you stop pouring, the liquid will flow and carry over the curve, dribbling down the side of the teapot. Anyway, back to the task at hand. With the spout attached, I can now begin pulling the handle. And I start by pulling a long, relatively thick length, which I'll separate into two or three segments. This isn't the final handle shape, it's the blank. And it's this which I'll attach to the teapot and then begin pulling again into its actual final shape. I snip them off against the sharp edge of my workbench. And again, I've pulled three, but I'll only use the very best one. One of the blanks is selected and the end of it is tapped out like so. This creates a flare, which will make blending it into the teapot body much easier. I score a section opposite the spout with the lid off so I can really see what I'm doing and make sure everything lines up. The scored marks are slipped and then I take the handle blank and press it firmly against the body of the teapot with the fingers of my left hand reaching in inside and bracing the walls. This way the force being applied on the outside doesn't bow the wall inward. The flared portion of clay is then blended into the body of the teapot, just like the spout was. It being securely joined at this stage is crucial for the next step. Otherwise, when you begin pulling it again, there's a high chance the length can just be ripped off the vessel. I can then take the vessel in one hand, and I think it's at this scale that you can really see how small it is, and using a soaked right hand, I pull that length of clay thinner and finer, working it into its final shape. And once it's thin enough and is projecting at a similar angle to the spout, I take the end of the handle in one hand, loop it down and press it firmly against the body of the teapot. Due to the angle it's attached, I can blend the clay in here much more firmly, as compared to the top join, which is why I don't score and slip the bottom join. I then blend the bottom so it joins the body flush, replicating the spout in a way. I want both components to look like they've organically grown from the vessel, rather than looking like they've obviously been attached. I use a wetted finger too, just to burnish the clay and to remove the worst of the smudge marks. I try not to fuss around with it too much at this stage as it's really easy to make a mistake and to damage it as the clay is just so soft, but I will do some alterations the following day after I've given the clay some time to dry out as when it's firmer, it's stronger and it's much more difficult to make a mistake. For the time being though, I'm going to dry this pot upside down overnight. This way there's no chance that the shape of the looped handle sags over time as the soft clay dries. It's not a bad replica, although the size of the facets on the shoulder are different, and the handle on the small teapot could be slightly larger, but nonetheless, it's a fun exercise scaling down like this. It really makes you look, especially when you're doing it without taking any measurements, and you're doing it entirely by eye. With the handle now set firm, I'll dry this pot wrapped up overnight. This way the soft clay of the freshly pulled handle will acclimatize to that of the body, the two components becoming the same consistency in texture. And there's one last thing I'll do before I actually finish this, and that's quickly carve the underside of the handle. So the curve flows into the body really smoothly. That's much better. I'll now let this teapot turn bone dry over a couple of days, but for the first 24 hours or so, as I really don't want any cracks to develop around the joints, I'll leave it covered in plastic. About a week later, and the teapot is now completely bone dry, so I'll load it into my electric kiln for a bisque firing to 1000 degrees Celsius, a process that changes soft, recyclable clay into much harder and stronger ceramic that can no longer be recycled by simply slaking the vessel down in water. 
Sadly, I can't show you the rest of the contents of this kiln, but it fires automatically by itself, slowly raising in temperature throughout the night. And I place a longer prop on the vent through which moisture and gas can escape. Once unpacked, the pot now has to be prepared for glazing, and that begins with waxing. I start by centering the vessel, and then I brush a thin bead of wax around the rim and about half a centimetre down on the inside. Next, I wax certain parts of the underside of the lid. Essentially, wax is applied anywhere I want to remain bare clay. It acts like a simple resist, preventing the water in the glaze from being absorbed into the porous body, and thus a layer of the raw materials that make up the glaze can't be deposited on the surface. I water the wax emulsion I use down a bit, so that it brushes on a bit more evenly. Otherwise, this is a very easy, quick step. You just have to make sure you're accurate and don't get wax on any part of the pot you want to be glazed. And once the wax on the rim of the pot has dried, which only takes a minute or two, the teapot is flipped upside down, centered, and the foot ring is waxed, with an extra dab over my maker's mark to make sure it's properly sealed. And with the teapot waxed, I can move on to glazing. And if I'm being totally honest, glazing teapots might be my least favorite activity in the entirety of making pottery. Although I'm really hoping that with this thinner glaze, it should be easier than the previous glazes I used to use. They had to go on in very thick layers. After being dipped, I look down the spout to see if the holes are blocked, and if I carefully blow down it, I can unblock some of them, but the rest I'll have to figure out later. I keep the pieces submerged for about four or five seconds, and then I quickly draw them out and keep them moving so that the droplets don't settle, and I'm left with a smooth, even surface. It's now the following day, and the tongue marks themselves can be carved away and rubbed over, the glazed dust that comes off filling them. And this mossy green glaze, I promise it will be that colour eventually, contains more clay and bentonite as compared to my other glazes, and therefore it dries into a harder layer that's actually a bit more difficult to tidy up, as it's far less powdery. There's a slight ridge of glaze I have to tidy up around the base, which I do with a paring knife, working over a basin of water so that I collect all the glaze dust, which can be saved and used again later. I'm still not entirely sure if I need to clean up all those small dots you see covering the surface. I don't think I do, yet I can't really help myself. The straining holes on the inside were more of a challenge, but I use a clay tie which I bent to grind away the clay that coated these holes. As soon as it starts to chip off, it does come away easily, but you can't force it, as at this stage it's really easy to make a mistake, such as if I slipped and chipped the glaze off another part of the interior, which I hate doing as it means I've got to go back in later and repair it, so instead I just take it slowly. It can be a bit of a pain, but it's wholly necessary, as a teapot that doesn't pour well, well, isn't particularly useful. But that looks good enough for me. I have to do a similar thing with the lid, although this is much more straightforward, as I've got easy access to both sides. So I use a sharp potter's needle, like a drill, slowly pushing it through until it breaks into the other side. Again, this is worth doing carefully, as I could just jam the needle through in one motion, but in doing so, I would likely chip away tons of glaze on the other side, as the metal point breaks harshly through it. To clean the rim and the base of the teapot, I find it's easiest to do this on the wheel. The pot is centered, and then I use a soaked sponge to clean a perfect line around the very top of the rim and where glaze meets clay on the inside. It's then flipped over, and I placed it on a prop to do this, as the tip of the spout and handle were very close to touching the wheel, and I didn't want one to collide with the other. And it's easy to center the vessel, as I can just tap center the prop underneath it, as compared to trying to tap the actual pot itself, which would be a disaster in many ways. With the foot clean, I can move on to wadding the lid and placing it on top of the teapot. I keep the wadding in an airtight box, wrapped in plastic, and regularly spray down with water, as this mixture of 50% china clay and 50% coarse alumina hydrate dries out really quickly. It's a highly refractory combination, meaning it barely melts whatsoever, even when pushed to the hottest temperature my kiln goes. And all I'm going to need are five small balls of it, like this, which I press against the wax on the underside of the lid. And it's these that will keep the lid and the body of the teapot separate during the firing, as if I were to place the lid on top of the body without anything in between, the two parts would just stick together. So it's placed atop, carefully, making sure that the locating flange of the lid doesn't come into contact with the rim of the teapot. There's probably a millimetre gap all the way around. 
The next step is to pack it into my Rhoda KG340 gas kiln for its 9 hour reduction firing to cone 10, which is about 1290 degrees Celsius. The firing begins at about 7 o'clock in the morning. The kiln is lit with the door open so that excess gas doesn't accumulate inside before being ignited. It's then sealed up tightly and my morning rituals can begin. That starts by opening all the windows and the skylight to ventilate the space and to keep fresh air being pulled into the workshop. The kiln does have a large hood and a huge chimney, but I always feel better with a bit of a breeze coming in. My neighbour's cats, too, will do almost anything to get inside my workshop. And with the skylight opened and the kettle boiled, it's time for the most important part of the morning making a large French press of coffee to keep me going in these early hours. During this early stage of the firing, I increase the temperature very gradually, slowly easing it up bit by bit until I reach 860 degrees Celsius, at which point I initiate the reduction atmosphere. I do this by sliding the damper to be half closed and by increasing the gas and air pressure rather dramatically. This forces too much fuel into the chamber with an insufficient amount of oxygen for it to properly burn. As a result, as the burning atmosphere is seeking oxygen, it ends up taking it from inside the clay and glazes themselves, thus doing something only a gas kiln or a wood kiln can do and it's this altered atmosphere that chemically changes the iron which gives you certain colors that are only achievable with a kiln like this and once cone 10 is bent over the kiln is switched off crash cooled down to 1000 degrees celsius and then it's fully clammed up and allowed to cool down properly over about 36 hours and at long last this small green teapot can be unpacked and as you watch this end sequence you'll see just how much its color changes depending on the light it's shot in but so far, so good. Nothing seems to have stuck. The glaze is really nice and even all over it with no thick or thin patches noticeable anywhere. These lids aren't normally too difficult to get off, but this one was a bit stubborn. I couldn't pull it off with my hand. In fact, it's not a very good idea to rip it off as hard as you can, as that could damage the pot, especially the rim of the teapot, as chunks can be torn out of it if it's really stuck. So instead I tap it carefully with a chunk of wood to hopefully dislodge something, and that seems to have worked. The waddings themselves come off easily enough, with the needle tucked underneath them. But through the magic of firing, the lid now no longer fits. This happens sometimes, but not usually this bad. So to fix that, I'm going to be using this stuff, Chemico Valve Lapping Paste. I smear a small amount of it on the underside of the lid, usually the coarse stuff to begin with, and then I move on to the finer grade if it needs it. The lid is then slotted into the body of the teapot and the two parts are ground together vigorously for as long as it takes. That's beginning to fit much better, accompanied by sax and guitar by my neighbours next door. Next, I wash this stuff off with some hot soapy water. And that's the teapot now properly finished. This glaze has a lot of depth to it, despite it going on in a much thinner layer, which means, and this is something I really love, the clay work underneath shows through more, as in, you can see the shape I originally threw and trimmed much more clearly. It feels really smooth, much more than the normal crackle glazes I use. It also seems to be more fluid, the glass moving and pooling into thicker bands of intense colour where it gathers up. I really like the lid, and you can see tiny white crystals that have just started to appear, a byproduct of using titanium dioxide in order to colour this glaze. In combination with red iron oxide, there's 1% of each. Do let me know what you think of this glaze, as there's a chance I may begin using it far more regularly on my work. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, the pour test. It's surprisingly good. It's not quite laminar, but it's pretty neat and tidy. And yes, I've seen that viral video that shows a variety of teapots like this being poured and puts them on a scale of good to bad. Have you also seen the video that shows how many they have to smash in order to find those perfect ones? It's incredible. Probably one in every 20 passes, with the rest being smashed to smithereens. I'm not searching for the best possible pour that ever existed. It just has to work well, which this one does. 
When the hole is covered, the liquid stops pouring, and it comes out in a nice, even stream, without glugging or sputtering at all. It's also comfortable to hold, and doesn't dribble too much, if at all. What I really look for in a teapot that pours well is some vigour in the stream. It needs to shoot out of the teapot, the liquid tea funnelled in such a way that it flows out with some ferocity, instead of just tipping out of the spout, like a waterfall, anyway. Thank you so much for making it all the way to the end. Do let me know what you think of this new glaze, and as always, I'll see you next time.